My name is AJ Grant Scrutton, and I am the uh, CEO of the La La Studios. Uh, as I've said before, the reason I always say CEO is because the reality is I actually work for my mum's garage. I have my Nan's freezer to one side of me and her washing machine to the other. Um, there have been numerous calls with important people where my lovely grandmother has walked in the room with offering me a sandwich or a drink while I'm on a Skype call, in which case, not quite understanding the concept of a webcam, she thinks she can slowly back out of the shot and no one will notice. Um, so, it's not incredibly glamorous. Um, so, this is my slide, Rated E for Essex. You people have heard from some lovely, eloquent presentations with beautiful decks and facts and figures. You are not going to get that from me. What you're most likely to get is the occasional bit of bad language, some awful enunciation, and it'll probably be incoherent to a lot of you all the time. Um, what I will say is, if you are easily offended, you're fucked, to be honest. So, um, so, I'd like to start my presentation off with a quick slide about me, because the reality is, most of you don't have a fucking clue who I am, and probably don't have any reason to. So, I thought I'd give a bit of background information. Like a lot of yourself, no doubt, I went to university, uh, did a degree in computer science, which halfway through the course changed its name to computer software development, or it might have been the other way around. Um, Either way, the course was about as good as the title in process. Um, there's a great picture of me there looking like I'm having a very serious conversation. The reality is, in that picture, I was actually arguing with my mother over what flavour pizza we'd be having that evening. For those of you that are interested, pepperoni did win. Um, so I went to university, you know, I believed all the hype. You're told you go there, you spend three years, you do your exams, you do your coursework, and you get that magic bit of paper. You know, that bit of paper that walks you into a 40 grand a year job. You know, you're going to definitely get a job because you've got this magic bit of paper. Uh, and that wasn't the reality. As I imagine, it wasn't the reality for a lot of you, although you're probably all smarter than I am. Um, I spent seven months looking for a job once I finished uni. And this wasn't just some half assed get up, play video games for the whole day, and then look on the web for two hours. This was getting up at seven o'clock in the morning, applying for jobs until I went to sleep, you know, going for interviews, doing online tests, and hearing the same thing over and over again. Oh, yeah, yeah, great, you've got a degree, that's fantastic. Um, so how much experience have you got? Well, what experience? I just spent the last three years in university. Where was I meant to get the experience from? You know, I had better things to do, like not turn up to university. Um, but it, it wasn't fun, you know, it was hell. Um, and it taught me a lot of lessons along the way. It taught me that I really should have been focused on making a portfolio, um, for one thing. But after seven months of, you know, striving hard, you know, but desperate to get into the games industry with my magical bit of paper, I finally got the job of my dreams as an IT technician at a timber merchant. Um, it is just as glamorous as it sounds. How many people in the audience have seen the IT crowd? Show of hands, please. Okay, that's glamorous compared to this job. No word of a lie, I had days where they couldn't handle turning the machine off and on again, so I'd have to get up, leave the IT building, go across an industrial state into their building, and literally turn their PC boxes off and on again. Um, but it was a job nonetheless, and it kept me going. And I was only there for three months. Um, and three months down the line, I got an interview um, and got hired to work on Stella Dawn, which, according to Mr. Gerhard, is one of the games that uh, Jagex isn't proud of. So, um, and I was there for three years. Uh, first six months were the best time of my life. You know, it was amazing. I was finally in the games industry. It's what I'd always strive to do. And the next two and a half years taught me a lot of hard lessons. You know, how quickly things can change, how easily relationships can break down. Um, and after being a, there at Jagex for three years and working on Stella Dawn, my old boss, Enrique, who gave me the job at Jagex, um, then hired me to go work at Bossa Studios in London. So when I joined Bossa, I was employee number nine, um, and we were making this little Facebook game called Monster Mind. And it was kind of really cool, really fun, family mentality. You know, Jagex at the time when I was there was about 350. I know they're more now. But this was being employee number nine. It kind of, it was mental. Everyone knew everyone's names. Everyone went out together. Um, so we got that game out in about nine months. That was 2011. And then the following year in 2012, we actually uh, went and picked up a BAFTA for best online browser game. Um, and this was amazing, you know. This was going on four years in the games industry for me, but it was my first game I'd released. And for us to pick up a BAFTA, it just blew my mind, you know. I squeezed this horrendous fat body you see before you into a tux, you know. My beard was even more impressive back then. Um, and there I was rubbing shoulders with celebrities and actual people that mattered in the games industry. Um, and it was kind of a bit of a, an epiphany for me. It was kind of a big moment where I started thinking about things. You know, I'd always said I wanted my own game studio by the time I'm 35. 
Believe it or not, I'm not even 30 yet, and at the time I was only about 27. Um, but it felt right. You know, it's kind of, I didn't have a mortgage, and to touch on something someone said earlier, I didn't have any kids that I know about, at least. Um, so it just felt like the right moment. What I should mention is, when I was at Jagex, a guy started there called Craig, and for some reason, unbeknownst to me, they made me his mentor, which, as you're probably gathering, seems like a strange move. When I went to Bossa, I then ended up bringing him with me again about six months later. So when, we went, when I went to found Zalala myself, it made sense that, you know, Craig and me did it together, because we knew otherwise we'd start stalking each other, and eventually down the line, he'd end up with me anyway. So I've got to fast forward, because I haven't got much time. Um, First seven months of Dalala, we formed a studio. We had three grand between the two of us, and that was it. We called it the Idiot Method. Uh, we released our first game, Janksy, in nine and a half weeks. It was the top-rated Windows 8 game for a very long time. Um, didn't make a lot of money because it was Windows 8. Um, so, you, no, they know I'm only joking-ish. Um, uh, we got featured on the front cover, Develop. They put me, Craig, and our 15 chins between us on the front cover. And then suddenly this strange thing happened, where I was introduced to this guy called Lee Shinneman. Um, and I've known who Lee is for years, so much to, so to the fact that when I got this email introducing him, I didn't actually think it was the Lee Shinneman. Um, you know, it was just kind of a casual thing, meet up, get some advice, kind of show me how to run a studio. I expected him to sit me down and go, AJ, you don't have a fucking clue what you're doing. He would have been completely right. Um, we met up for coffee a few times in London. And then on the third time, he looked at me and said, AJ, you know, we've been chock chatting, I'm starting this new studio, um, Lift London, and we're looking to bring an indie studio in house and incubate them. And I went, I looked at him and I went, oh, who's it gonna be? And he just looked at me and he was like, do you honestly think I would have had coffee with you three times if it was gonna be anyone else? I was like, fair enough. So in we went. Um, this was the original agreement. It was gonna be a six month incubation. I got to pick our team, got to pick our project. All our money was covered. They paid our salaries, our equipment, our licenses while we were there. Any IP we created belonged to them. And we got to work with amazing people while we were there. The guys that made Banjo-Kazooie, Simon Carter, co-creator of Fable. You know, this amazing wealth of talent. Um, the original six-month contract then rolled on to be 13 months, um, and we left this January. And so getting to the point of the talk is I wanted to discuss some of the lessons I learned while we were there. You know, some of the things I noted down, some of the things that took me by surprise. To some of you guys, it's going to seem obvious. To some of you guys, it's probably everyday life. But I'm hoping that to some of you, kind of, it gives you a heads up if you're ever in a similar situation. Before I start, I just want to say I am still on very good terms with Lyft and Microsoft. Any, which, anything I say which seems derogatory is just me being an absolute Essex asshole, and it's not meant that way, okay? Um, so this was a big one. Communication has direction, and everyone likes it differently. Cool. So this is how I've always pictured communication. It's me, and I talk to people, you know, and that was it. Uh, I would talk to my boss the same way I talked to somebody else managing, the same way I was talking to a QA, to an artist, to a designer, developer. I never changed. You know, that's how I've always been. What I found out is in big corporate structures, direction has communication. Everyone likes to be spoke to differently. Everyone likes the information delivered differently. Um, and this may seem like a strange thing, you know. This isn't me saying talk down to some people, but you do hear the term, you know, communicating upwards. And this is that, Managers, leads, directors, they all care about different parts of the business. They all care about different parts of your game. You get high enough up the chain, and some of them don't even care about the game. They just care about the business side around it. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a reason that these guys are billion-dollar companies, and I founded a company with 3,000 pounds. You know, They know what they're doing. But it was a big shock to the system. I wasn't expecting this. I hadn't ever kind of been in a situation where I had to change the way I deliver talking to someone, you know, change the way I speak to certain people compared to others. Um, and it knocked me back, it took me by surprise. Craig was quick to point out when I showed him this slide that whilst I always said this was me and talking to people, the reality of how I've always been is probably more like this, and Mark can probably attest to this. It's usually been more like this for me. Um, and this is why I had to start my own company, you know. I haven't ever gotten well with my managers. I am a loud mouth, you know. I do rub people the wrong way, but I always do it for what I feel is the best for the project. You know, I'm never, I've never been a big one for personal gain. This isn't me saying I'm an amazing person, but I've always been a believer in if I think something's better for the project, I'm going to voice my concerns. Um, you, you can't do this in the situation I was in. You know, I couldn't be telling, you know, I wasn't going to stand there until Phil Harrison to fuck off, for instance. You know, it wouldn't have done me any good. Plus, Phil's an incredibly lovely man and didn't give me any reason to, but I had to adapt, I had to learn to evolve. Um, and this kind of leads into this stuff. 
Yes, this is ironic. I know that's not pretty, but it's probably the prettiest slide I've got, to be honest. Um, when I was doing my decks beforehand, I would just cover them in walls of text, you know? All the information I need to portray needs to go into this deck, you know? Shove it all up there. Oh, this goes there, this goes there, this goes there. 60, I'd have 60 slide decks, all full of text. Um, did one of my first kind of practice green light presentations. Quickly found out that no one in the world, let alone managers, wants to read all this text, you know? Pictures are the way to go. The best way to deliver this information was basically to know the information myself, to be able to portray it, to be able to answer questions, put the detail in an appendix, but just use nice pictures to convey your points. If you can round your game up in like five to six slides just using pictures, you're going to have a much smoother time in a lot of these meetings. Um, cool. Fantastic. Um, and another big thing that came out of this was that if you put loads of, loads of information up, there's people in the room that will choose to pick on the information you haven't listed. So you'd go into a green light meeting, there'd be 15 people. You could safely assume that five of them probably didn't know a lot about games, but needed to make themselves asserted in the room. So you'd get people to ask questions for the sake of being spotted. I see a couple of smiles in the, face, in the audience from people in higher positions that probably know this. You'd get the people who had nothing to do with the game, nothing to do with the creative. They'd read through all your information and they'd be like, yeah, he's definitely forgotten something. <clears throat> and so I'd, in the middle of a meeting, sweating profusely, of course, because I'm not slim, um, would I let them ask the question, and that would be it. I'd be knocked. I wouldn't know what to do. I'd be recoiling, trying to gather myself. And that one person has, A, just been a complete arsehole, but B, they've asserted themselves and make me look like I don't know what I'm doing, which was heartbreaking, because I'd be spending 15, 16 hours a day, you know, going through this deck, practicing these decks. So I quickly learned that wasn't the way forward. You know, go with simplicity and just go with knowledge. You know, t show the decks to people beforehand. This is a big one. So for any small studios working with the big ones, if you're in a room and there's going to be 15 people, do your best to get one-on-ones -on -ones with as many of those 15 people in advance. Take them through the deck. That way they can ask their questions there. The assholes are always going to be assholes. They're always going to ask questions, but you can kind of reduce the amount of questions you're going to get. This does jump all over the place, by the way. I do apologize. So this was kind of the process of working. So this is very much how Dalala works nowadays. We have an idea. We prototype the ugliest looking thing in the world. We play it. We have more ideas. We prototype it. And eventually, down the line, we'll make it look prettier. Um, that's not a final screenshot from the game. It's just all I had to hand. But the point with this is that you know, fun comes first for me. It's always been very important that something is enjoyable straight away. If, you're, if moving around an empty room doesn't feel good, then you're failing. It's what we call the Mario 64 test. Anyone that's played Mario 64 can attest to the fact that you could just run around the castle for an entire day and you'd be still having the best fun in the world going, yep, yep, yahoo, you know, and that's what mattered. Um, we test to have that. Movement, jumping has to feel good, build on that foundation. Um, and what we found is that not everyone works that way. And that's fine, you know, everybody works in different ways, but there was processes in place now. So we'd have an idea, we'd pitch the idea, we didn't have to get the idea approved, then you'd have to pretty it up, and eventually kind of the fun came in later. So if you're presenting a game to kind of somebody high up the chain, you can't just present the world's ugliest prototype like we would to ourselves. You have to do something which visually looks compelling, which kind of, I'm gonna use the horrible term, a vertical slice of the game. And I'm not a big fan of this at all. I don't really understand the point of building completely one section of the game if it's not in the national, na natural throw of development. Um, but this is how some people were working. So it, this was another thing that knocked us back. We had to completely change our working process. What's next? Cool. Um, and what I found with that was it caused a lot of kind of pent-up creative aggression. Like, we'd have lots of meetings in the mornings with Delala, and we'd get very frustrated because... We had a great idea, and we needed to check that the idea worked. And then, you know, because making a game is like writing an album. You know, I think somebody commented on it earlier. When you write an album, you don't write 14 songs for a 14-track album. You write 20-plus songs so that you get all the shit out of your system, and you can pick the best ones. Making a game is similar to that. You want to get as many ideas out of your system as possible, test them, see what sticks, and kind of keep with those. This process didn't allow it. This process put kind of walls in between each stage. And I've seen this process work, and for the bigger companies, it does work great, um, but it just didn't work for us. So, meetings, emails, and meetings about emails. So, I'm pretty sure some of the upper management people in the audience can probably relate to this one. Um, this is two things. Firstly, 
This is literal. There were times I had meetings about emails, about meetings, about emails. And sometimes you'd be in a meeting. No, you're five minutes. No, um, sometimes you'd be in a meeting and somebody would be like, let's continue this in an email. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. <laughs> I'm never getting asked back to this one again. Um, but yeah, sometimes you'd be in meetings and somebody would say, okay, let's take this to an email. And you'd know full well in your mind that as soon as that email chain started, two or three emails down the line, somebody would go, this is way too big a topic for email. Let's take this to a meeting. And it was kind of like, Jesus Christ. But the big point that came from this is, I'd been a programmer my whole career who wanted to be a designer, who become a company director, who suddenly became full-time Outlook. You know, I, I had to stop scheduling myself into sprints because I couldn't do any work on the project because all my time was taken up with meetings and emails. And, you know, there is good purpose to it. I know some of my friends in similar positions now, even though they're not working with a major, they're still finding all their time going on business when they really want to be doing development. And this is a really important lesson to learn, you know. If you're going to get in bed with the big boys or if you're going to take on a lot of responsibility yourself, be prepared that you're not going to work on the game anymore, you know. And if that's something you don't want to be doing, you need to get someone to sit above you and handle all the business stuff because it is time-consuming. You know, you have to do horrible things like staying in a Hilton for a few days while your mates are back home working their asses off. It's just, it's terrible. Um, cool, buzzword. Good ideas go bad. So a lot of these words are good, right? Stuff like sprint, lean, agile, this is all stuff I think is fantastic. We use bits of it ourselves, um, and I think it just, it completely changed how we make games. The problem is that these are buzzwords, and you get people who aren't part of the development process, um, and this is completely separate to a lot of the other stuff, but the Microsoft stuff, this is overall, right? You get people that learn these words but don't learn what they mean, and then try to enforce you using them. So, oh, I heard that this studio is using uh, Sprint and Scrum mentality. We should definitely use it. So what is Sprint and Scrum mentality? Oh, it's something to do about whiteboard and post-its and daily meetings. Just go do it. And then they'd enforce it. And then... No one has a clue what they're doing. No one's ever worked in that before. Somebody's read five words on a website about some other studio doing it, and suddenly they want to do it. You know, And there are good mentalities here that can get ruined for developers because lean and agile and stuff like that is fantastic. You know, It does change the process. It does change how you work. But if you end up doing it for someone else and they do it shittily, you know, it, just, it ruins it for you, and it's hard to kind of get into that enthusiastic mindset about it. <laughs> My own, sorry about this, I'm so out of shape, I can't even talk. Um, my takeaway from this slide is that, you know, do your research. Before you start throwing these words out and enforcing them to other people, make sure you know exactly, A, what they mean, and B, what bits you want to do. These aren't a one-size-fits-all mentality. Agile is not going to work for everyone. That doesn't mean you can't take the bits that you like and the bits that, that work and make your own kind of process from it, but you can't just do it straight from the book. Cool. Freedom is earned, business is business. I went in under the assumption that Delala would go in, you know, we're a bunch of youngish guys, be super creative, we'll make whatever we want, and that's it, you know, they'll just chuck money at us. Woo, go Delala, money bitches. Um, reality is that sort of freedom is earned. Um, a business is still a business. You have to prove your idea is going to work, you have to prove there's kind of place in it for the market. When you're just doing a game like we are now, we don't necessarily have to do that. It's handy if I can look at it and go, well, the game is super fun, and yes, there is a place in the market for it. But when you're going to a company like Microsoft who are looking to invest a lot of money into that project, you have to make sure you can back up your idea. Show them where the gap in the market is, show them where you want to do it, and show them some figures. Um, and that's when I kind of learned that freedom is earned. The more successful you are within a big corporation, the more freedom they're going to give you. <coughs> cool. Green lights are terrifying. Um, don't know if any of you guys have seen Phil Harrison. He is an incredibly lovely man, but he is massive. I mean, he makes me look tiny. And he is so intimidating in the sense that his career has been fantastic. And he's massive, right? Um, so having to do a green light to him was just terrifying. But what I quickly learned is that he's not an asshole. And a lot of these guys in these high positions who have actually worked their asses off to get there aren't assholes. And so I took loads of things away. You know, he had asked questions that were good questions. He would make me think about the game in ways I hadn't thought of before. Not because he was trying to catch me out, but because he wanted to try and open it up a bit to me, make me look at things differently. Um, and I honestly think going through these green lights prepped me for more than anything I'd done previously in my career. You know, they helped me with my, my investor meetings, they helped me talking to publishers now, and I just think that yeah, it was a fantastic process. Um, 
But be prepared to be scared. And don't be afraid of the fear. You know, it's going to come, it's going to hit you. Just make sure you're prepared. Like I said, have all your information together in your appendix and just learn your deck beforehand. Cool. I'm, I'm speeding up, I'm speeding up. Cool. So minor difficulties. This is my past and present team. Um, so this is what we found when we went to kind of back to the garages. As of January, we went back to the garages again. Um, building a team is hard work. You know, you have to get a bunch of people you can trust. And for me, it's even more so, not because I'm better than you or worse than you, but because we completely work distributed. So none, we're not in the same room very often. We all work kind of over webcam, over Google Hangouts, over Skype. And when we first started the company, we had to throw together kind of part-timers, guys in full-time jobs doing work in their spare time, graduates. We'd find people that would work for free because we were working for free at first. Um, and it made me value how good a good team is. I've worked with some fantastic people, both at Bossa and Jagex. Um, and that's why I stole most of my team from Bossa and Jagex. Um, no, not really. Not legally, at least. Um, <laughs> But you know, hiring is the most important thing you will ever do. Those of you that are in a position where you hire, it is so important to hire, hire right rather than hire fast. I've seen people who hire quickly to fill a role, and in the end, you end up spending 90% of your time with 10% of your staff because they're problem staffers. So just make sure you take your time and you build the right team. Cool. Uh, I can skip through this, basically. Keeping stable, keeping structure. So this is one of our big difficulties. When we're not in the same room... Is that going into this one? Cool. Together. When we're not in the same room, it's hard, right? You don't have that natural banter off each other. You don't have the ideas bouncing. You don't have each other being pigs as much to each other as you'd like. Um, and it is difficult. You need to keep focus. You need to make sure that your team is willing to keep that focus. It's all well and good that I plan out these sprints. We do the daily meetings. We jump on webcam what we need to. But you need to make sure everyone on your team is fully motivated. They all love the project and they're all fully invested in the studio. For us, it's really difficult because our current game is a two to four player, same room multiplayer game, and there's five of us not in the same room at any point. Um, so kind of, it's been a bit difficult. Blue sky, I'm hurrying up. God, don't leave me alone. Blue sky thinking. So one of our rules, and it's not an amazing groundbreaking rule is, but like we keep design and tech separate for a large chunk of the creative process because I don't want my designers catering to the tech guys. I don't want my designers being restricted into a box what they think tech can accomplish. What I really want is that my designers piss off my tech guys, and my tech guys piss off my designers, and then I straighten the whole thing out. So we do blue, complete blue sky thinking. Whatever the idea is, throw it out there, let's see how it goes. If we all like it, we like it, we'll try it. Um, but that needs an anchor. You do need someone who can kind of, at the end of the day, pull you back and say, yes, AJ, you're getting really excited. It is a great idea that so-and-so's had, but it's going to take us two months, and we're meant to be getting the game out in a month. Um, and Ben, my tech lead, is my anchor. He is super passionate about the game, super invested, works his ass off, but he has got no problem telling me to fuck off. And that is exactly what I need. I need that person who will put me in my place. And if I, as the boss, sometimes get too invested, he will fully pull me back and say, look, this is a good idea, but we can only accomplish this much. You know, I'll push it for this, but we cannot do this. So keep your creative process separate to your tech guys, but make sure you do have at least one anchor in the team because if everyone gets excited about an idea, it's very easy to rush in and try and do it straight away. Conclusions, as if there are any. Um, major mentality isn't for everyone, especially us. We did the major thing. Okay, I'm right at the end, actually. It's good timing. We did the major thing. We had a fantastic time. We learned a lot, but it, didn't, it doesn't suit us. It doesn't suit how we work. We can't wait two weeks to go through legal for a name. We want to just Google it. If no one else is using it, that's the name we want to go through. Bandwagons. If you're jumping on, you're too late. It's very easy to look at the success of others, like Clash of Clans, and go, oh, man, we should do a city builder. But the thing is, that market already exists. Somebody is already smashing that market. By the time you get a game out, the market would have either moved on or you're going to struggle to steal their players. Try and be original. Don't just jump on something because it might make you money. Cool. Safety nets. Safe isn't always best. Don't go for the easy option. Don't go for the safe thing. Don't go for something you think, you know, is going to do all right. Always try and push yourself. The more risk you put in, the more chance of reward there is. And trust your gut. It is always right. There's been a couple of times in my career where I haven't trusted my gut and I live to regret it. And there's been other times when I've just gone with my gut. It seemed like the worst decision I've ever made right up to the last minute and it's paid off. I think that's the end. Uh, 
Cool. So I was going to announce this early, but I think it went out at one o'clock. We did announce today that we've actually signed with Team 17 to publish our new game, Overruled, which is exciting news for us because we're all hardcore Worms fanatics. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be a great partnership with us. We're very honoured to be working with these guys. Um, and thank you guys very much for listening to this shit for the last 20 so minutes. <laughs> Cheers, dude. <laughs>